Today in series of Doplexus KL interviews, we have with us Dr. Brian Pinto. He's the Chief of Cardiology and Director of Cardiac Cath Lab Poly Family Hospital in Mumbai. Thank you so much, Doctor, for this interview. Thanks. So my first question to you is, can you brief us about acute coronary syndrome? See, acute coronary syndromes actually are a situation where the patient gets into uh, trouble because of a, either a ruptured plaque or because of an erosion of a plaque about 80 to 90 percent of the cases are because of a rupture of the plaque which is there in the coronary artery and about 10 to 20 percent of them are because of uh, erosion of the plaque and another maybe two or three percent is because of coronary spasm so these are the patho pathological mechanisms this may lead to one of the three conditions it may lead to an acute myocardial infarction st elevation myocardial infarction it may lead to uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction which is also called STEMI or it may lead to unstable angina. Now the difference between the th three is like this. In an acute ST elevation myocardial infarction the blood circulation to that particular artery is completely cut off. It's a hundred percent block and the patient presents with usually with acute pain or there could be other presentations and this patient either has to have a uh, pharmacotherapy in the form of a uh, lytic agent administered to him as quickly as possible, something like streptokinase, tenecteplase or retiplase, or better still, uh, he could have a primary angioplasty, uh, okay. you know. But in our country, very often, it's not possible to get a patient to the cardiac catheterization laboratory fast enough. So what we very often do is what we call and do is pharmacoinvasive therapy, where mm -hmm. we administer the pharmacotherapy uh, in a smaller hospital or can be done even in an ambulance and within the next 3 to 24 hours this patient can be taken up for an angioplasty which is called as pharmacoinvasive therapy. On the other hand an unstable angina is a situation where there is no elevation in the troponin levels. Uh, there may be ECG changes or there may not be ECG changes but there is no elevation in the cardiac enzymes and this patient is not as big an emergency, uh, can be assessed and then decided sometimes even with uh, some kind, some form of a stress test uh, whether this patient needs to go for uh, cardiac coronary angiography or not. And in the middle comes the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, the NSTEMI as we call it, in which there is an elevation of the cardiac enzymes mm -hmm. and depending upon the risk uh, involved, for example, if the patient has ongoing chest pain or if the ST segments remain persistently depressed or if the enzyme levels are markedly increased or if the patient has some form of hemodynamic instability then that patient goes in for a very early angiography. If there is none of this then the patient can be taken up after a 24 hour period for an angiography and then decided whether this patient needs to have an angioplasty or a surgery so on and so forth. Uh, so moving on to the next one, what are the basic risk factors that are associated with this syndrome? See these patients are usually uh, people who have risk factors. For example, uh, they could have, uh, they could be smokers, uh, they could be diabetic, uh, hypertension is another risk factor which is commonly seen. But very frequently we are seeing young patients who are presenting to us with acute coronary syndrome without these classical risk factors. Mm -hmm. So these are the non-classical risk factors which we are seeing. For example, we are seeing patients who are coming with stress levels, inadequate sleep, uh, people who work in, in BPOs and things like that, who, who, who way, work up, way, who sleep, stay awake at night mm. and work in the daytime. Then we have people who are possibly very heavy smokers who come to us with this particular uh, acute coronary syndromes. Younger and younger patients, I think pollution also pay, plays quite a big role in the in this acute coronary and these are the non-traditional risk factors apart from which I mentioned mm. to you to, to you before. So we are seeing a change in the risk factor uh, situation in our country and maybe in mm. other countries as well. Right. Uh, so lastly I would like to ask you what lifestyle changes one must adopt to reduce this such risks? I think the most important is all of us should know uh, whether we are hypertensive or not. So I think everybody should know his blood pressure. That's, that's an absolute must. 
Secondly, person should know their lipid profiles. For example, by the age of 18 or 20, you should know your lipid profile. So you should have one done. Uh, number three, you should check for your sugars on a regular basis. You should know whether you're diabetic or not, or whether you're even pre-diabetic. So these three traditional risk factors should certainly be reduced. Number four, you should be physically active. Uh, sedentary lifestyle also plays a risk factor role. Obesity plays some of the role. So you should maintain your body weight correctly. You should exercise. Sleep, as I mentioned to you, is very important. Six to seven hours of sleep, at least seven hours of sleep every day at, at proper times uh, should, be, should be insisted upon because that's another risk factor. Cigarette smoking should be out, out. Any tobacco, any form of tobacco, not only cigarette smoking, but right. any form of tobacco should be out. And in whatever way we can do to prevent pollution, whether it be noise pollution or whether it be air pollution, uh, if we can avoid that, then that's another risk factor. And stress as much as we can, you know, uh, bring in meditation, bring in yoga, bring in other things, yeah. other forms of stress to be reduced. I think that will also help. Right. Right. Thank you so much, doctor, for this interview. It was a pleasure you. having you here. Thank you. Thank you.